Hello, I'm Brian Flores, curator of the Waring Historical Library at the Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston. And I would like to welcome you to the Macaulay Museum of Dentistry. Uh, Macaulay is a small um, museum documenting the history of dentistry, but it's a fascinating collection developed by the Columbia, South Carolina dentist, Neil W. Macaulay. Dr. Macaulay was an avid historian of dental practice, and during his lifetime, he amassed a large collection of dental um, memorabilia. His collection was donated to the University of 1972, and this building uh, was built in, and opened in 1975. Uh, the museum houses an impressive collection of items, including historical tools and instruments, a 19th century dental office display, a collection of dental chairs, which document changes throughout the 20th century, and a traveling dentist chest from the Civil War era. So we're going to take a closer look at the collection and give you a chance to see what we have here. And uh, hopefully at some point you'll be able to come and see us in person. So why don't we get started? The museum is divided into sections according to different aspects of the profession of dentistry, such as prevention, extraction, and so forth. Prevention, of course, is really the beginning of dental care. The museum has a number of examples of products that helped individuals participate in their own dental care. One early theory about tooth decay posited that decay came from tooth worms. By the scientific revolution of the 17th century and the enlightenment of the 18th century, the belief in tooth worms declined. Pierre Fouchard in particular found the idea ludicrous. Fouchard, the father of modern dentistry, published in 1728 a book that became the standard of the professionalization of dentistry, warning of charlatans, and promoting concepts such as fillings, care of the teeth, and even pain management. He wrote that, quote, tooth decay was linked to sugar, sugar consumption and not little creatures burrowing into the teeth. This section of the display transitions between prevention and extractions, showing some of the tools for extraction as well as other products used in prevention as if to warn viewers, this prevention or that extraction. There is an old Colgate tooth potter container and other examples of toothpaste, floss, toothbrushes, and forceps. Extractions are what most people think about when they think about the worst case scenario in seeing a dentist. And it is what most people imagine when discussing the history of dentistry. The barber surgeons of medieval Europe are the forebears of today's dentists. The earliest instruments used for extraction are the pelican and the tooth key or turnkey. The pelican appeared in French and Italian books dating to 1363 and 1483 respectively. The pelican received its name because it resembles a bird's beak and was used until the early 1800s when the turnkey replaced it. The forceps replaced the turnkey in the late 1800s, although some practitioners continued to use the key even later. The turnkey got its name from how it was utilized. The key was inserted into the mouth, the claw was hooked over the tooth to be extracted, and the handle was then turned as if opening a doorknob. This form of extraction could be extremely painful and often resulted in broken teeth, fractured jaws, and soft tissue damage, as well as the removal of surrounding teeth. Technology certainly has had an impact on dental care from the beginning. Even new instrument designs could be referred to as technological changes. In the 19th century, dentists used technology to expand into laboratory work creating a variety of items, including dental appliances, dentures, bridges, and crowns. In the modern era, dentists became experts in the use of radiography, despite its early dangers, experts in the preparation of filling materials, 
and experts in the operation of safe and sterile workplaces. Some dentists accepted laboratory work from other dentists and eventually expanded the work to comprehensive commercial preparation of dental appliances. W.H. Stowe and Company of Boston, founded by Dr. William H. Stowe and Mr. Frank F. Eddy, became the first successful industrial dental laboratory in 1887. The display shows an atomizer used to spray disinfectant in dental offices and labs, and other tools such as burners and sterilizers for instruments. New technology, of course, meant to x-ray machines. This unit was purchased in 1912 by Dr. David Aiken after witnessing a demonstration at a Southern Dental Association meeting in Asheville, North Carolina. Dr. Aiken was the first South Carolina dentist to use an x-ray machine in his practice. It has a lead acid battery for power charged by filling the jars in the cabinet with distilled water and sulfuric acid. Two metal electrodes were placed in the jar, creating a current transferred to the battery. As the effects of prolonged radiation exposure was better understood, efforts were made to reduce exposure for dental practitioners and patients. The second x-ray machine is from the Ritter Dental Manufacturing Company with patents dating to 1921. This machine included the spring timers that allowed a dentist to precisely control the time of exposure needed to obtain a usable x-ray. On the back of the timer is a chart to calculate exposure for adult and child patients. And of course, this made using the x-ray a little bit safer than using some of the earlier versions. Part of the improvement in technology, of course, was the improvement in pain management. And here you could see some of the tools that were developed to improve pain management throughout the 20th century. One of my favorite pieces in the collection is the Duke University Inhaler Model D for self-administration of trialing. In other words, this was pain medication that the patient administered on their own. If you look closely, you could see the directions provided for using the device, how it was placed on the patient, and how the patient then controlled the administration of pain relief. This section demonstrates examples of student work. The work represents examples of student technique work used in dental morphology class. Dental students in morphology class learn about the shapes of teeth and their relationships to each other and to the mouth. Most of the examples displayed here were made by South Carolinians attending dental schools in other states before the 1967 opening of the MUSC College of Dental Medicine. The museum has several examples of dental office tools. The tools you see here are those of an itinerant dentist in South Carolina. Dentists in urban areas or even small towns carried their practice to remote areas of the state by horseback or by buggies. As late as the 1880s, a number of dentists continued to travel great distances in South Carolina to treat patients in communities without a full-time dentist. Dr. Charles Thaddeus Dowling, who practiced in Orangeburg and Barnwell, South Carolina, used these tools as a traveling dentist, including the folding chair, foot-powered drill, and instrument case with mother of pearl handles. There are three displays documenting changes in the dental office during the 20th century. This example is reminiscent of offices sometime between 1900 and 1929. The dental chair is based on a design developed by James B. Morrison in 1872, who a year later also pioneered the design of the foot pedal powered drill. The apparatus for air pressure and suction was created by C.M. Sorensen Company of New York and was used widely in dental and medical offices as well as hospitals during the early 20th century. The machine's glass dome covers the motor assembly 
and allows the operator to view the components at work. The first three decades of the century saw dental innovations such as the porcelain jacket crown with widespread use of Novocaine for pain relief, dentists were able to do more complex procedures. Other innovations of this period included lost wax casting machine for making bridges and dentures and a shock proof x-ray machine. Also the concept of cleaning teeth by a dental hygienist emerged in Bridgeport, Connecticut in 1907 with the first program to train hygienists established there in 1913. By this time in South Carolina, dental offices in all but the most rural parts had electricity and running water. The next office setting resembles those found during the 1930s through the 1950s. The chair was made by the Harvard Company and featured hydraulic mechanisms used for raising and lowering the chair, as well as adjusting it from left to right. The water-powered motor attached to the chair was designed specifically for areas without electricity and was controlled by a foot pedal. The unit was produced by the Alford Dental Motor Manufacturing Company, invented and patented in 1904 by dentist William B. Alford and his brother Edwin P. Alford, both of Sumter, South Carolina. The wooden cabinet was typical for dentists until the mid-20th century. The shallow drawers were ideal for glass instrument trays and maximized the amount of space for hand pieces. The upper cabinets stored bottles of restoration materials or other items used for operations. Despite the hardships of the Depression and World War II, the practice of dentistry advanced during the middle decades of the 20th century. New dental instruments, materials, and techniques allowed dentists to provide better care to their patients. On the home front, the introduction of the nylon bristle brush, toothbrush, which was less expensive to produce, became more accessible for consumers, improving home health oral care. The introduction of fluoridation into municipal water systems, although controversial, strengthened teeth and improved the dental health of the general population. Meanwhile, the profession was making strides in the area of specialization. This is an office you might find in the 1960s. The child's chair was the first of its kind. In 1907, S.S. White Dental Manufacturing Company designed this chair to specifically accommodate children. Before this, children sat in adult-sized chairs that may or may not have movable booster seats. Neither the patients nor the dentist was well-suited for the booster adaptation. As more dentists entered the field of pediatric dentistry, chairs designed for children became more prevalent and went through the same transformation as adult chairs in terms of form and function. Fully reclining dental chairs arrived on the scene in 1958 and cemented the practice of sit-down dentistry in which the dentist attended his or her patient while seated. The 1960s were known for advancements in sterilization. Sterile disposable needles were first used by the military during World War II, and dentists began using them in 1959. Dentists also adopted the use of the autoclave and its method of cold sterilization to sanitize dental instruments. By the early 1960s, most dentists had acquired high-speed drills with attached water coolants. Drills were belt-driven or air-driven. New dentists equipping their office for the first time often chose to use air compressors. The metal cabinet made of steel came into use with the advantage of being easier to clean and the need for a sterile office environment. The design did not depart much from its wooden predecessors, though convenient new features were tucked throughout, such as a sharpening tool, two lead-lined compartments for x-ray film, and a pop-up area for storing bottles. That is the end of the virtual tour of the Macaulay Museum of Dentistry at the Medical University of South Carolina. I am Brian Fors, curator of the Waring Historical Library. Thank you for joining us. I know it's fun. One I love through his blindness, you that I'm thinking of.
Amen. 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 Amen.